Okay. Hello, students. Um, we're presenting you with a video today of the, on the experiment called the uh, kinetics of the muter rotation of glucose. And I'm going to begin by talking about just a little of the theory. Most of it's in the lab manual, but I want to refresh your memory. So uh, we have two forms of glucose. Well, here's glucose, okay? Um, but it's got two forms, alpha and beta. This is beta. And notice the one difference is right over here where the OH is down for the alpha and up for the beta. And you've all learned about this in organic chemistry. So uh, the two forms can uh, equilibrate. You can react in the either direction. Um, basically, this oxygen gets protonated uh, and the ring gets cleaved and then this, this group can rotate. That's what happens. So our question is, what's the kinetics of this muted rotation? So there's going to be a rate constant in the forward direction and a rate constant in the reverse direction. Um, we're going to follow this reaction in a clever way. Each of these molecules is chiral, so it will rotate polarized light, plane polarized light. Um, so, and that's described here. Now, uh, there's a, an unfortunate, uh, uh, unfortunately the conventions for the way we name things is confusing. So these two forms are alpha and beta, but by convention, the degree of rotation of the light is also called alpha. So we have two alphas running around. Therefore, <laughs> instead of getting alpha and beta there, I'm gonna say A and B. It's not convention, but it works better for us. Anyway, the alpha or A form, uh, when it's pure, has um, this uh, rotation of 112 degrees and this of 18.7 for the beta. Okay, so um, these are the specific rotations. They're independent of concentration. The amount of rotation you actually see will depend on several things. First, it will depend on the concentration you make obviously. So your angles won't be quite this large because your concentrations will be smaller. And uh, it will also depend on the ratio of A to B that you have. So if you had a 50-50 ratio, you'd have halfway between this, uh, these angles for the specific rotation. So that's the principle. Um, now, without going through the theory, um, you can uh, measure, you'll, what you'll do is you measure the actual rotation, we'll call that alpha, at some given point in time. So uh, this alpha naught is the rotation at the time that you start taking measurements. We'll call that time zero. Alpha t is the at any particular time. So you'll simply measure alpha at various time points. Alpha equilibrium is the degree of rotation after equilibrium is established. That really won't be for like overnight. It'll take a while. Um, anyway, the log of that is equal to k observed t. K observed is a rate constant, but it really is a combination of these two. Read the theory to see why. All we can really measure, or we're interested anyway, is K observed. Okay. okay, so that's one, that's kind of the beginning. Now, it so happens that this reaction can be catalyzed by acid, or as far as that goes by base, but we're only interested in acid. So what we're going to do, well, so first of all, K observed, if you really get down to it, uh, can be written this way. As, so K observed is a, a rate constant for a neutral solution plus a different rate constant, Ka. This is Kn, this is Ka for acid. 
that times the concentration of H plus. Okay. Now you can work out the theory, but let's just take that for granted for right now. So in other words, if you have a solution, there may be two different mechanisms for uh, the reaction to take place. One of those is very slow, probably, and, and that's governed by K neutral. And the other is faster, that mechanism is governed by Ka times the concentration of H plus. So, what are you going to do? You're going to create four solutions. So, and each solution will have a particular concentration, a particular pH. So it's all described in the lab manual, just how you create these, I don't care about it right now, so I'll just give them labels. So you'll create four different solutions with different H plus concentrations. You won't do any solution with uh, without acid because it's so slow you'd be here all day. We'll just have those four. So what do you do? Well, for each of these reactions, uh, you're going to carry out a, an experiment. And uh, by measuring all the alphas at different times, um, you'll be able to make a plot. Let's just call this whole thing right here, oh, let's say log of F, where F is what's in parentheses. So you'll then plot log of F uh, versus time. Now according to this equation, that will be a line that will have some slope. Notice there's no intercept because there's, there's no constant term here. So it really should go through the origin. Your data will be scattered, but you'll fit them with a line and the slope of this line, I'll call that M, the slope, will be equal to K observed. Now this was for a particular value of H plus, maybe H plus one. So we'll call that K observed one. Then you're gonna do the same thing for solution two. Um, now you can probably predict this slope's going to be larger than this one if this H plus concentration is larger than this one. Anyway, uh, two, right? And then you do it again, and then you do it again, right? And you'll get four different plots. Um, H of log F versus time but for different H plus concentrations. Okay, having done that, you put it all together and we'll make one more plot. We'll do this one in red. Now we're gonna plot K observed versus H plus concentration. So each of the slopes here is a K observed, and so you'll get, now you're gonna have four different values for your different H plus concentrations. Maybe it looks like this, I don't know. Best fit line. The intercept is Kn, and the slope now is Ka. Okay. So you get your Kn and your Ka. In terms of uncertainties, don't worry about the uncertainties up here. They'll really all be present within the, this, they'll, they'll be present in the scatter in these points, essentially. Once you do this, though, you do want the uncertainty in the slope and the uncertainty in the intercept. And to do that, you're going to have to get those, you're going to have to do a regression. And you've done regressions before for other experiments, um, so I don't need to talk about it. Okay, so let's just for a moment talk about the, the, the timings you have to do. 
you'll have to do each of these runs, of course, four runs. And for each of them, you will probably set up a table of alpha and T, you know, zero, one, two, this is minutes for time all the way down to 15. And you'll simply get an entry. This, this is gonna be alpha, this entry here is alpha naught, and then you'll just make your entries. Now there's one other thing you're gonna need, and that is alpha equilibrium. Um, in the lab, if you were able to do this in the lab, you would need to wait overnight, really, for the equilibrium to be firmly established. So um, that then uh, is really overnight is good enough. Okay. So you just set the solution up on the bench and come back the next day and take your measurement. Um, that's, that's the data you need. Now in principle, these angles depend on temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. So for very precise measurement, you also want to make a note of the room temperature, okay? Our polarimeter does not establish a temperature. It's whatever the room temperature is, that's what you get. So uh, you'll see that as well. We're not gonna make a temperature correction uh, because it's not a, this is not a very swiftly varying function of temperature, but, but for good best practice, uh, we'll make a note of it. Okay. Okay, so right here we have the polarimeter, and um, let me talk about it for a little bit. So it turns on back here. You can see in the lab when you get here. Um, here is the number of degrees of rotation of the polarized light. Now if I open this trap door, <laughs> right here is where you set your cell. So the beam of polarized light passes in that way. Now we have a cell right here. This is filled with distilled water. We will want to put this in here and then uh, zero, the, uh, upper, zero the instrument with this inside. So let's go ahead and do that. Oh, before I say that, one end of this comes off. So when you're in the lab, you'll have to do that. Take the end off. There's a glass plate at the end. It's actually expensive because it has to be uh, made so that it, uh, you know, passes polarized light through very cleanly and clearly. So it's kind of expensive. So uh, you want to be careful with that. So we'll set that in here, just like that. Close the door. Okay, now I should have said, when you first set up the apparatus, you turn it on, and you should wait 15 minutes, let it warm up. Um, what you want to watch for is that this number is steady. It doesn't matter what it is, but it needs to be steady. Otherwise, if there's a drift, then we have to attend to the drift. We can't have drift. But this is, this is settled down. Uh, now notice it's minus 0 0.20, so I want to zero it. I'm going to press the zero. Okay. So I think that's good, and um, we will, uh, in a moment, we'll take that out and put in our solution. But let me tell you what's going to happen first. So we're going to have to empty this uh, distilled water and put in our solution. Um, this is a 50 mil Erlenmeyer flask. We'll need to fill to the mark. But first, this is already has our, our acid in it and some of the water. Um, I have a pre-weight amount of the glucose. Uh, so we'll put the glucose in here and swirl. The critical thing is you only want to add that glucose when you're really ready to start. Because as soon as the glucose goes in, reaction commences. Now you can wait a minute before you put it in here. Whenever you start, that's time zero and that's where you start from. But if you wait too long, uh, the concentration will be small when you start. And that will mean that your ultimate precision will be small. Accuracy may be good, but if the precision is small, that's going to mean you just don't know. Your, your error bars are going to be pretty large, your deltas will. So we're going to stop this right now as we continue getting set up, because you know how to make solutions. Okay. We have our sample. We've already put it in. This has actually the 10 mils of the acid solution. 
mixed in the stock solution. So uh, I've got a chart set up of alpha versus time from zero to 15 uh, minutes plus one for equilibrium. We're gonna open the door, put this in. Okay, so our starting value is right here. Um, start, start your, tell me, are you ready for time zero? I'm gonna count down five, four, three, two, blast off. 7.637, now you have to tell me exactly when we get to one minute, okay? We're just gonna do this for two minutes and we'll stop. You can see how it goes. Okay. Are you watching when you get to one minute? Okay. <laughs> Tell me when we get close. Countdown. Okay. Give me a five, countdown of five. Okay, uh -huh. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and go. Okay, I got it. 7.536. Okay, let's do one more of those, and then that'll be enough for the demonstration. Okay. This is the whole story, right? <laughs> it's, that, it's that readout. But you can be quite precise, quite accurate. I mean, I can I can read that to one thousandth when he says you know zero. So I can be really quite accurate as long as there's no drift in here, as long as we know our concentrations precisely and accurately, we can get very good data here. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and 0. Okay, got it, 7.438. So that's how you take your data. We would go all the way to 15 minutes. So that would give us 16 data points times 0 through 15. And then we would wait overnight and take a final measurement the next day to get alpha equilibrium. That's one solution. There are three others to do, total of four. But on, the, on day one, you can take all your readings on all four solutions, and then you, you'll get your equilibrium values the next day. So I think that concludes, uh, concludes this. You just have to clean up, of course, and leave everything the way you found it. Okay, so we'll distribute the data to you and you can analyze it.